All right, so moving on to the final segment, I'll be sharing my AEW World's End pay-per-view summary. So this will be my AEW World's End pay-per-view summary that took place uh, this past Saturday in the world of wrestling. So I'll be sharing my whole entire main card, main pay-per-view card of the some of the pay-per-view that just transpired in AEW. So the first match on the card, we see in the eight-man all-star tag, we see in Brian Danielson, Claudio Casanoli, Mark Briscoe, and Daniel Garcia defeat Jay White, uh, Roosh, Brody King, and Jay Lethal. So I thought it was a great job putting all eight of these competitors that were part of the AEW Continental Classic all on the card for an eight-man all-star tag. I thought it was a great way to get all eight of the uh, all eight of the wrestlers on the card for their work that they did in the AEW Continental Classic. And I, this match gave all eight of the wrestlers a good chance to shine, and everybody had their moment in this all-star eight-man tag. Uh, Daniel Garcia was the star of this match, hands down. You had Magic at the commentary table trying to put his guy over in the match. Uh, the crowd and the announcers were behind them the entire match. Uh, he picked up the win for the, his team in the eight-man tag match. Uh, you can see the hostility still between Brian Danielson and Daniel Garcia after the match. Uh, obviously, they have history with each other. Uh, and then you had Brian Danielson cutting off Daniel Garcia and his interest heading into that eight-man all-star tag matchup. A little hostility at the end of that, but I do believe that Daniel Garcia is a future star for AEW. I do believe that 2024 might be the year he has a great face run. Uh, I do believe they have, he, this man has a lot of potential. He could win some gold there in AEW this year. would not be surprised if Daniel Garcia gets pushed. But moving on to the next match, you had Miro defeat and Andrade El Idolo. Uh This match was kind of weird to get started. It was a slow-paced match. But the pace of the match picked up in the second half of the match. Uh, I'm not complaining about it. It was a good match. And you can't go wrong when you have two talented guys like Miro and Andrade El Idolo getting in the ring with each other. But it was a good match. But I noticed the crowd was really not into it. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, but I do believe that Andrade El Idolo is on his way out. And it's sad that Tony Khan and the rest of the AEW executives dropped the ball on Andrade and Idolo. It doesn't it doesn't take much to know that the man is talented and the man it was very successful when he got on the big time stages on the big time platforms when he was with WWE, especially when he was the NXT champion, having classic matches with Johnny Gargano at NXT Takeovers. How do you not push this man to the moon? And he should have been a champion holding some type of title in his time with AEW because this man, they dropped the ball on him. He had several managers. I do believe that when he got there in 2021, he had Vicky Guerrero. They tried to give him Chavo Guerrero. They tried to give him another luchador manager. And then he just gave him CJ Perry, Miro's real-life wife, which that none of those gimmicks make sense for Andrade El Idolo. So I think this was bad booking for Tony Khan and AEW. And it's sad that Andrade El Idolo only had one singles pay-per-view match for him being a part of the company for two and a half years. I think the rumors are true. I think the speculation is true. I do believe that Andrade El Idolo will be heading back to WWE very, very soon. But it's sad that they dropped the ball on him. Next match, you had Tony Storm successfully retain her AEW World, Women's World title against Rio. I thought this was a good match. Uh, Tony Storm was controlling the pace of the match against Rio, who was uh, centered as the underdog for this match. Uh, Tony Storm was one of the most interesting, has one of the most interesting gimmicks in wrestling. Uh, she's an interesting tweener, someone that's a face, someone that's a heel. With her, it's it's very bizarre, but I have to give it, I have to give her credit. It, she has one of the best gimmicks in the wrestling today. Now, the finish was a little strange to me. I'm not sure if it was a modified DDT that Tony Storm was trying to hit on Rio, but nonetheless, it was a good match. Uh, just kind of sloppy finish. Then the next match, you had Swerve Strickland that defeated Dustin Rhodes. Uh, this was actually supposed to be Swerve Strickland versus Keith Lee on the pay-per-view card. Uh, I seen, because uh, when I was watching it, I was confused why Keith Lee wasn't going to face Swerve Strickland. But there was reports that Keith Lee is actually not medically cleared to compete at the moment. So <coughs> best for him. Best wishes go out to him. Uh, Dustin Rose stepped up to the plate. The man is like fine wine. He does not age. 
Uh, he gets better as he ages and moves on. The man is, is in his 50s and moving like he's still in his prime. Uh, but hats up to uh, kudos to him for stepping up uh, and giving us Swerve Strickland still on the card for him to face Swerve Strickland. But I think not talking about the Swerve Strickland and Dustin Rhodes match, but I think it was going to be a bad booking decision regardless to have Keith Lee versus Swerve Strickland because why would you have this on the pay-per-view card at World's End? Swerve Strickland was just a part of the Continental Classic. He could have been competing with somebody that was not successful at the beginning to the finals of the Continental Classic. Maybe someone like Jay White before the eight-man all-star tag was created. I think, or you could have had him in a match with actually Aldrade El Idolo. But it didn't make sense for Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland to face each other finally because the two former World Tag Team Champions were feuding with each other back in 2022. We were just at the end of 2023, and AEW never booked Swerve Strickland or Keith Lee to have a big match with each other to actually finish the feud. So why would you randomly just put this together days before the pay-per-view card? That just didn't make sense to me. I thought that was a bad booking decision. I still don't think it makes sense for the two to feud at all at this point because the feud just went up in flames and nobody cares about it at this point. But Swerve, going back to the Swerve Strickland Dustin Rhodes match, uh, Swerve Strickland was in control for most of the match due to the at attack that he had on Dustin Rhodes before the match started. Uh, decent match. Uh, I do believe that Swerve Strickland should become a world champion in 2024. The time is right. Uh, what him and Prince Nana are doing are pretty entertaining on a weekly basis. And I think that is one, Swerve Strickland is one of the best wrestlers that AEW has. I would not be surprised if he wins the world title by the end of 2024. He should get pushed to the moon. Then the next eight-man tag, we had Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Darby Allin, and Sting defeat the world tag team champions, Ricky Stark, Big Bill, Powerhouse Oz, and Kenosha Takeshita in an eight-man tag. I don't understand why there was two eight-man tags on the card. I think one would have been good enough. And I think this one was really thrown together. I don't understand why Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara are now buddy-buddy with each other now. I understand that Kenny Omega is out with an injury right now. And they had a tag team. Him and Chris Jericho had a tag team. But that doesn't mean pair Sammy Guevara back up with Chris Jericho after he just turned on him just a few months ago. So I didn't think that was a good booking decision either. And I wasn't a fan of this match. Whenever Darby Allen is literally in a tag team match, the heels literally beat the brakes off of him and he takes unnecessary punishment until he gets the hot tag to his tag team partner to get the crowd back into it. It happens all the time when Darby Allen's in a tag team match. But Chris Jericho shouldn't have wrestled on this card. And Tony Khan and the AEW executives know that. And Chris Jericho damn well knows that because he has... Uh, he should be on the sidelines right now. He has sexual allegations after him right now in real life. I think that's actually pitiful to have him on the card. The car booed, the crowd booed the hell out of him. I think he needs to be on the sidelines till his sexual allegations are addressed. I think that's the professional thing to do. And Chris Jericho, Tony Khan, and the rest of the AEW executives know that. So moving on to the next match, we see Julia Hart successfully retain. Her TBS title against Abandon. <coughs> um, match, the match was decent. Uh, it was under House of Black rules. I'm not really a fan of the House of Black rules. Uh, I think it's bad for viewers at home watching. Uh, the screen is just very annoying. It, what are you trying to hypnotize us when we're watching the House of Black matches? I, I'm not a fan of them. Even when the rest of the House of Black, like Malachi Black, Brody Key, Buddy Matthews is a part of those matches. They're, they just don't make sense. And I think AEW needs to move away from the House of Black matches. Uh, next match. <clears throat> we see Adam Copeland defeat Christian Cage in a no disqualification match to become the new TNT champion. Uh, I really, I, to me, this really was not a match. Now, get it. It was a good match, but it really wasn't a match because it was an all-out street fight that just inflicted punishment on the other wrestler using weapons. It wasn't like a wrestling match that we see on the other on the whole entire card, but nonetheless, it was a good match. And I think Adam Copeland and Christian Cage made up for their first match that they had in AEW. They main evented AEW Dynamite uh, a few weeks ago for the TNT title. The match just was very slow, play, uh, so slow pace. I didn't think either wrestler lived up to their potential that they could have gave us in the first match. 
Uh, and then the finish was very sloppy when Nick, uh, when Nick Wayne's mom getting involved, uh, it was just very sloppy, but, uh, they made up for it in this match, but the thing booking, booking, booking is a problem on this card because why would you have Adam Copeland win the TNT title? Then two minutes later, let Christian Cage take away kill switches opportunity that he earned on zero hour to get a TNT title match anytime he wants. That was just a waste of letting Adam Copeland win. And then it seemed to me like it's deja vu. I've seen it before. It seemed like a money in the bank contract situation where somebody can cash in on somebody on the champion whenever they want. <coughs> Mainly when the champion is vulnerable. Adam Copeland just went through one hell of a match and no disqualification match. Hmm. Interesting. What does a money in the bank cash in do? Cash in when the champion is vulnerable. What did Kill Switch do? Cash in when Adam Copeland was vulnerable. But Christian Cage took his contract and then just beat Adam Copeland again two minutes later to win back the TNT title. That is bad booking, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That cannot happen. Uh, and I'm not sure why AEW has not pushed Kill Switch to this point. He went from Kill Switch to Lucha Source. And he's a former tag team ch world tag team champion and former TNT champion. So why not give the man the push he deserves at this point? I think they're wasting his potential. Uh, next match. In the co-main event, we saw Eddie Kingston defeat John Moxley to become the first ever, ever AEW triple count tri triple crown champion in AEW history. But let me say this. The AEW Continental Classic was one of the best things that the company ever produced. The AEW Continental Classic, you had wrestlers like Eddie Kingston, John Moxley, Brian Danielson, Andrade El Idolo, Jay White, Swerve Strickland, and several others that made this tournament very meaningful in wrestling today. It's definitely one of the best things in wrestling that we've seen in the last month. The Continental Classic, all the wrestlers are part, that were part of the Continental Classic made it actually mean something. And all the matches were very great, very memorable and I was surprised that Eddie Kingston was the one that won the Triple Crown and became the first ever AEW Continental Classic winner. He actually started off this uh, tournament 0-2 and was in danger of losing his Ring of Honor title and his other title, uh, open weight title, but won all of his matches afterwards. And that was a great booking because I did not see that coming. Uh, John Moxley and Eddie Kingston had a great match. They produced a great match with each other at AEW World's, uh, World's End. It was very physical. It was a very hard-hitting match. It was finally great to see Eddie Kingston get his big-time moment in professional wrestling. Having his big-time moment winning against John Moxley and holding all three of the titles to solidify himself as the first ever AEW Continental Classic winner and the first ever AEW Triple Crown winner was a great moment to see. Great that Eddie Kingston finally got his moment in wrestling. And then the main event, we saw Samoa Joe defeat MJF to become the new AEW World Champion. The match was great, and it was great uh, creative idea to have MJF have a special video package for him wrestling in his hometown of Long Island, New York. Uh, I thought that was great. MJF deserves a lot of credit because for what he did, did in this match with a legitimate shoulder injury. Uh, you could see in the match, he could barely lift up his, his whole entire shoulder. Uh, the reports were saying he was having pain, taking painkillers on a nightly basis just to get by to finish this match or to have this match. But I do believe it was the right call for Samoa Joe to win the AEW world title. Tony Khan has booked it and, and AEW executives have booked Samoa Joe very well since he's broken onto the scene in AEW as a former TNT champion, former Ring of Honor uh, t television champion, and he dropped the title for his aspirations to be an AEW world champion. And they booked him like a Samoan monster that we all know that Samoa Joe is. It's been a while since Samoa Joe has led the company as the main man, as the world champion. We know his days in TNT, but he never got the opportunity to do that in the WWE. It's nice to see Samoa Joe back on top in the mountain as the AEW world champion. I think he was the right guy to the throne a vulnerable MJF. And I think Samoa Joe is going to have a great run with the AEW world title. But everyone knew at the aftermath, everyone knew that Adam, uh, Adam Cole was the devil. And he was the devil. It was playing the gimmick for the last few months. Everybody knew that. It didn't take much to not know that Adam Cole was behind the scenes. And he finally re revealed himself as the leader of the group. And it was, uh, I think it was a bad choice to reveal Adam Cole 
uh, as a devil then because he's still not medically clear. He's still in a walking boot and still in crutches, walking on crutches. But it's great to see that he has a great group. Uh, he's the leader of the group with Wardlow, Roderick Strong, uh, and company. So I think MJF is going to take some time away. I do believe he's re-signed with AEW. I just think he needs time to reach uh, the heel his injured shoulder and take a few months off. But overall pay-per-view grade I gave on the pay-per-view, I give it a C plus at best. Uh, had great matches, but two eight-man tags were unnecessary to have on the card. The TBS title uh, and the eight-man tags really could have been a part of an episode of AEW Dynamite or AEW Collision. Uh, but to me, there's really only three matches to go back and look back at on a nine-match card, which is not good for a pay-per-view card. I mean, Adam Copeland versus Christian Cage, go back and watch that. That's memorable. Eddie Kingston versus John Moxley was memorable. Go back and watch that. Samoa Joe versus MJF was, mem was memorable. Go back and watch that. The biggest mistake of the night was truly letting Adam Copeland win the TNT title and only hold the title for two to three minutes just for him to lose the title again. To Christian, to Christian Cage, the man that he just beat, I think that's a bad opportunity. And him stealing away Kill Switch's opportunity, I think that was just a bad booking decision. Overall, I give the pay-per-view a C+. But that is all the time I have for you guys today. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. This is your host, Times Tyree, signing off. And I'll see you guys on next week's episode.